Okay, so thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Uh, in, you know, this uh, small rules, uh, Lisa. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Ugo and Elisa. who have done an excellent job in setting up and arranging these sessions. And uh, uh, so we're looking forward to uh, starting this session very soon. Um, just again to highlight, please just state who any questions would be uh, um, best suited for um, when we uh, when we uh, have the presentations. You can ask questions during the presentations, but we will only take clarifications directly afterwards, and then we will uh, try to uh, bring the rest of the questions um, to the audience here, to the speakers uh, at the uh, after the four presentations. So I would like to welcome you all to the sixth episode of the Flexible Power Generation webinar series organized by ETN Global in cooperation with ETIPSNET, which is the abbrevi abbreviation for uh, the European Technology and Innovation Platform, Smart Networks for Energy Transition. Over the last month, we have hosted four Horizon 2020 projects, all with objective to increase traditional uh, power plants flexibility and efficiency. And today we are hosting Turbo Reflex, a project that is approaching its conclusions with exciting results. And since the launch in 2017, Turbo Reflex has worked on the development and optimization of technologies that can both help to retrofit existing power plants as well as new machines to enable more flexible operations. The Turbo Reflex Consortium brings together turbo machinery OEMs, end users and research institutes, all with a focus on improving the three critical turbo machinery components, the compressor, the combustor and the turbine. Key questions that were being asked going into this project were how can we achieve a cost reduction per cycles how can they achieve an increased load capability of the existing plants? And how can it be possible to double the load following capability of a combined cycle power plants? Now to gain a better overview and understanding of the results, but also the challenges in finding solution to these ambitious questions and targets, we have with us four speakers from the project that I would like to welcome and thank for the availability. And I will start with the project coordinator of the Turbo Reflex, Christian Alburg from General Electric in Germany. And then we also have Alexander Wiedemann from MAN Energy Solutions and Wolfgang Mohr from General Electric in Switzerland. And finally, Juan Carlos Garcia de Rio from Natugi. Now, without any further ado, I would like to leave the screen to our first speaker, Christian Alberg. Christian, could you please give us an introduction to the project? Yes. Can you see my screen? Can you hear me well? Yes. OK, good. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Christian Alberg. I am the project coordinator of the program Turbo Reflex and Turbo Reflex stands for Turbo Machinery Retrofits Enabling Flexible Backup Capacity for the Transition of the European Energy System. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief, brief overview of the program before my consortium partners will give you some more details from the various work package, packages that we have been working on. Um, you already mentioned uh, the consortium. Um, it's a fairly large consortium. We are 26 partners uh, across nine countries. Um, in particular, um, a large number of industrial partners. Um, you see all the major OEMs of fossil fuel power plants such as GE and Saldo, Dusan, MAN Energy Solutions, Mitsubishi, Siemens Energy, and then also as a utility, Natogy uh, being represented besides a, a, a large range of university um, research institutes, uh, uh, SMEs, uh, and the program is managed by Arctic. 
So the rationale of the program, um, I think, is fairly straightforward. Uh, we all know the EU is developing a low carbon economy, um, which includes the energy sector uh, with a large scale deployment of uh, increasing share of renewable energy sources such as wind and solar, etc. Um, and the renewable electricity generation has been growing fairly quickly and substantially over the past years, as you can see on the bottom left. Um, one challenge that comes along with that, however, is the intermittency of uh, those renewable resources. And this intermittency requires a very highly flexible backup capacity of almost equal capacity to the renewable generation. And I've taken a a uh, sample picture here um, of the electricity generation from wind and solar um, for Germany in April 2019. Uh, you see the fluctuations of wind and solar, um, the pretty sharp peaks there. Uh, and altogether um, at the peaks you have uh, 55 gigawatts and uh, it goes almost down to zero in certain areas. So uh, that's a fairly large um, up and down um, that needs to be uh, accommodated. And so <clears throat> the problem is that we don't have no large scale storage solutions available as of yet. They may come in the future, uh, but certainly not something on this magnitude that we'll have in a couple of years in the foreseeable future. So the idea of this program is that existing fossil fuel plant infrastructure can fill this gap cost effectively, but um, that also implies um, it needs to shift the role from providing base load to flexible backup power. And this creates a, a range of new demands on the existing fleet. Uh, so there's a need for high load change velocities, so high ramp rates uh, of the plants. Uh, there's a need for full turndown capability uh, and the need for start-stop mode operation with very fast restarts. And all of this increases the cost uh, due to increased wear of the various components. There's shorter lifetimes associated with that. There's a decrease in efficiencies if you're running off design most of the time and you may encounter unplanned outages, etc. And so the objectives of this TurboReflex program are threefold. So the first one is we want to reduce the costs per cycle um, of combined cycle plants by, for example, increasing part load efficiency, increasing resistance to wear, and also having more accurate life information so that uh, uh, the utilities can make proper trade-offs um, for, for the plants. The second objective is to increase the low load capability. Um, and with that, you would reduce the number of hot starts required by increasing the low load capability of existing plants to avoid shutdowns. And we'll hear more about this um, uh, later um, by Wolfgang Mohr, for example. And third objective is increase the load following capability, uh, which means increasing um, yeah, the following load following capability of the existing combined cycle plants. All these um, all these objectives um, are uh, to be met uh, by a range by a development of new technologies. Um, there's one work package that, that focuses on compressor off design operability. There's another one that focuses on hot gas path technologies, uh, and yet another one focusing on mechanical integrity and flexible operation. Um, these feed into an online plant analytics and monitoring work package, and this is then uh, translated into whole plant performance uh, in another work package. So that basically helps uh, to, to for the for the utilities to understand, for the operators to understand what is actually bottom line in impact of these, and how does it change uh, how I can operate my plant and what is the cost, uh, etc. So this is how the program is built up. Again, there's a range of new technologies that uh, are and largely have been developed already uh, that all combined. And there's also a program that was run before, which is called Flex Turbine, that complements some of these technologies. So these alone may not make for a very large change, but if you combine it with the results of Flex Turbine, we actually uh, cover most of the aspects of the plant. And if you put this all together, 
uh, there's a the, the hope is a fairly sizable impact um, in the flexibility of the existing plant infrastructure uh, that can be retrofitted and thus enable to transition to this new backup role. And with that, I think uh, I can uh, hand it over to the next speaker to talk a bit more about the details. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Christian, for, for this uh, introduction. Um, I don't think that there is any clarification questions or anything. It was very clear, of course, uh, this uh, just general introduction to the, pro to the project. Um, so then I would like to invite our second speaker, um, which is uh, uh, Mr. Alexander Wiedemann from MAN Energy Solutions. Um, to share his presentation on condition-based monitoring of turbine machinery components. Uh, so, Alexander, the, the screen is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Chris, uh, Christa, for the introduction. So, my name is Alexander Wiedermann. My role in this project is the coordination and the le leadership of the uh, condition-based monitoring issues of the turbo, turbo machinery components. And this is also the uh, topic I'm going to talk about today. Um, condition-based monitoring, uh, to explain condition-based monitoring uh, uh, takes uh, hours and uh, lectures. So uh, my um, uh, the purpose of this talk is just only to show how which role it uh, uh, plays uh, in the uh, improvement of and uh, of the flexibility of uh, turbo machines. Um, uh, so this uh, graph has been already shown by um, uh, Christian before, and on the uh, right hand side, you can see uh, all, uh, so in short, uh, just all the uh, topics we are uh, dealing with. Um, so we are have we have topics on the components gas turbine and uh, steam turbine. On the gas turbine, we are we have t topics on uh, making um, uh, compressors more flexible, and uh, so there's uh, even the idea uh, to use uh, a part of the compressor uh, to uh, charge, uh, say, um, uh, storage um, cavities for uh, compressed energy storage. And uh, this means that uh, the um, new type of compressor should be much more um, um, uh, flexible uh, than before. Uh, the same uh, is, of course, also on the uh, combustor uh, side. So if you want to uh, recharge again and uh, put it into the uh, combustor, for example, so they compressed air, then, of course, uh, there are uh, many new challenges we have to, which have to be met. And uh, at least in the turbine, uh, we have the everlasting story of just uh, making uh, hot gas path more resistance against the uh, harsh environment it's uh, working. Um, we have also a couple of um, uh, activities uh, on the mechanical integrity, and uh, altogether, of course, uh, um, is uh, very important. Is new because um, we uh, need uh, new technologies to make uh, so the uh, turbo machines more more uh, robust, and uh, so these. Uh, Development of these uh, uh, parts, uh, of course, uh, means that uh, we uh, make can have a direct impact on the improvement of the flexibility on stand times, on uh, availability, and so on. Um, and um, but uh, how can we uh, assure that this works uh, all uh, well together? And for this point, we need to uh, introduce. Uh, um, some uh, monitoring of the system, so the condition and efficiency monitoring system. Um, this uh, is uh, not only limited in our case uh, to the uh, components, gas turbine and steam turbines by themselves, but this uh, covers all the plant. Um, uh, saying the uh, efficiency, uh, efficiency monitoring system uh, gives us uh, the um, possibility that uh, all the parts will be um, uh, um, uh, so they um, 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 all, 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 all the parts will work together um, um, in the in the best way and in the most efficient way. And uh, so the condition monitoring system, of course, uh, shows uh, in how far uh, so uh, components and uh, parts in the uh, turbo machine uh, will meet the uh, harsher requirements by just uh, running up and down the engine more often. Uh, having more uh, low transients, and um, uh, this needs to be monitored, and we need an, to make an assessment uh, in uh, how far we have to uh, replace uh, parts. 
and uh, which mean maneuvers can be also uh, run uh, without any uh, difficulties and any uh, problems. And uh, in our uh, uh, work package uh, condition-based monitoring, we have basically four uh, tasks. Uh, one uh, tasks, uh, the first task is uh, the development of a monitoring system for a new fleet of gas turbines uh, based on um, um, uh, based on uh, um, test data, on uh, rig test data, but also on uh, analytics, on, on uh, flow analytics, on, um, um, on the um, uh, computations and predictions uh, doing, uh, being done uh, during the, uh, the design phase. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so this past task 4.1 is very strongly related to the past task 4.2, which is uh, the, uh, with, uh, which is, uh, uh, based on a, an existing fleet, already existing fleet. So um, the data are collected of about 50 uh, engines of the F-class. Uh, these are Siemens F-class engines. And uh, uh, so this big data uh, cloud is being um, uh, evaluated uh, using uh, using condition-based monitoring. Uh, we have a, we have another group uh, so, uh, around uh, Tucson uh, Skoda, uh, where the steam turbine monitoring system is in uh, um, in in the focus. And in this case, um, uh, steam turbine monitoring system development uh, is being done uh, to be capable of monitoring live consumption of critical parts. This means uh, also uh, development of new sensors, which are uh, ready to stand uh, uh, the long time uh, a long time period not only the time uh, for for a rig test but also for a long for the for all the operating time in order to have an idea about uh, some kind of rubs of the uh, um, of the uh, of the rotor tips uh, um, um, uh, flutter detection but also lcf detection in the uh, rotor environment and uh, last but not least, uh, so there are uh, special uh, probe developments on the uh, um, on the overall power system, which is uh, uh, or power plant, uh, which are uh, done by uh, GE and its partners. Uh, the vision of the uh, condition-based monitoring is uh, shown here in the case uh, of uh, say uh, a good and bad start uh, based on the. Um, um, uh, for instance, on the uh, combustor, which is one of the most critical parts in, uh, uh, concerning concerning the uh, availability and uh, uh, quick um, uh, st uh, start uh, uh, ability uh, uh, capability of uh, gas turbines, and uh, we have uh, basically three phases. One is the reactive approach, which is the uh, basically uh, just the uh, um, a standard uh, option, which is uh, common up to now, just to define what is a good start, what is a bad start, uh, uh, why does a bad start occur, and uh, uh, of course, uh, so we have we need also to propose uh, some uh, control parameters of how to control the starts. The next is uh, just to um, analyze the start procedure and see how all the uh, components and all the probes are working together. And uh, so for this case, we need some kind of analysis uh, method. We need some uh, kind of uh, visual visualization uh, uh, method. Actually, we have a pattern of, uh, of um, experimental data. And uh, so they need to be, um, well, uh, more or less um, analyzed using some kind of uh, 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 methods, which are very common also in face recognition algorithms, as you know. Uh, so uh, these will be used uh, to uh, um, uh, um, develop uh, models for the to forecast the future. The, this means after we have uh, uh, we have analyzed uh, the uh, starts uh, and uh, we need to uh, look into the more details. We need to see uh, what was the what was the cause, for example, of the failure of the bad start, and uh, where need to, where do we need to uh, make improvements and uh, which uh, and how can we. Uh, increase uh, actually or decrease the number of uh, bad starts or failed starts. And uh, at the end, of course, there should be a fully autom autonomous system, which uh, is uh, fully uh, fully uh, independent of uh, manual um, 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 uh, interaction. Uh, so the uh, four uh, basic steps of uh, um, uh, condition-based monitoring and also um, and machine learn uh, approach is that uh, we need uh, to um, 
um, collect the raw data and we need to analyze these data by just uh, several uh, um, 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 uh, means. Uh, for example, here it's also called neural networks and uh, a random forecast and so on. These means are just uh, looking at the data, looking at the pattern, recognizing the pattern and uh, uh, see uh, which pattern appears if we have, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, failure and uh, if we have an uh, 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 operation condition which is uh, which is uh, out of the normal and uh, after that uh, after we have uh, done this we need to uh, uh, check the data quality we need to check which data is are uh, uh, not normal uh, which uh, which is uh, probably based on uh, uh, faulty uh, sensors and um, um, we have to identify this and uh, uh, parallel to this we for, for instance could also uh, uh, run a lot of analysis in uh, just uh, introducing some uh, uncertainty some uh, failures uh, into the operation and this gives us uh, some ideas of uh, um, how uh, the uh, system behaves when uh, a typical uh, a fail failure in the operation appears and of course uh, finally uh, we uh, need to uh, make a prediction uh, and this prediction would be uh, uh, in, in this way that we can say how how long can we um, uh, continue operating uh, at this condition and where uh, do we expect uh, major problems uh, for the um, uh, for a um, um, concrete example uh, which i took from the uh, task 4.4 by siemens uh, we uh, see uh, that, for instance, the start-up procedure of the uh, gas turbine is uh, heavily dependent on the uh, combustor system. So this is the most uh, critical part. Uh, the, uh, so um, you can see on the uh, uh, left-hand side that uh, uh, most failures in the start-up procedure would be uh, six uh, would be 66 percent would be gas turbine related, and out of these. Uh, uh, failures, 76% uh, 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 is um, uh, due to the combustion system. And here we have a couple of uh, starts. Uh, so the x-axis shows a number of starts. Um, so the red dots means uh, this is uh, these are failed starts, and the uh, uh, green dots means these are uh, successful starts. And you can see that uh, so in most cases, uh, so the successful starts can be uh, computed um, uh, with a very high probability. Uh, this is uh, so the information are uh, just uh, taken from uh, convolutional neural networks and uh, so they uh, these con con convolutional neural networks um, enable machines uh, to uh, view the world as uh, humans uh, more or less. Uh, okay, uh, this is a very in, uh, important precondition for the uh, um, for the improvement of our system. Uh, but of course, in the next step, we need to analyze these data. We need to analyze uh, so the failures of the starts, and uh, we need also to analyze why, uh, in this case, the uh, uh, bad starts had 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 happened. And uh, some parts can be uh, reduced to uh, failures in some sensors. Some parts, uh, some uh, cases can be uh, reduced to uh, some uh, tuning problems. And uh, uh, so this system, of course, is newly developed. It, it has not been uh, is, uh, established, uh, is had, it has not yet been established to the, to the fleet, but uh, the expectations and some manual adjustments uh, um, uh, are very promising. And it is expected that in the uh, future, we can reduce uh, the starts by about uh, the uh, uh, failed starts by about 20 to 30 percent, and this is a very important step toward towards uh, the um, uh, increase of the um, availability of uh, gas turbine plants. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Um, I have one just uh, uh, clarification question here. Yeah. You know, when you were you were talking about the collection and the uh, <clears throat> interpretation of the data, but when you when we're talking about sensors, would it be required to have uh, new sensors, or could you use the uh, you know current sensors and 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 uh, uh, for for this? So would you need to have uh, implement new sensors? Yeah, uh, so um, uh, basically you need new sensors, you need improved sensors because they have, uh, they um, need to uh, uh, have a, uh, have been, uh, they need to be very long standing. So they need to be um, 
um, endure the operational time, uh, not only for for some test tricks, but also but for for the for all the operational time. In other case, uh, you need also to um, develop intelligence sensors. That, uh, I would like to refer to the steam turbine development where. Uh, so the tip timing system was improved uh, for 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 this kind of uh, flatter analysis and uh, uh, um, high cycle fatigue analysis uh, by just uh, being optimized and uh, being um, um, uh, being um, uh, prepared for high temperatures and uh, also for higher loading and uh, so also the um, um, uh, the probe size has to be uh, decreased uh, considerably. So yeah. the main problem is uh, we need uh, probes which uh, really uh, um, um, accompanies the uh, engine from uh, from the cradle to grave uh, in order to be sure that at any time we can uh, monitor uh, the um, gas turbine uh, uh, driven plant. Okay. That's, that's a major challenge, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, so um, we will uh, then move on to our third speaker, uh, which is uh, Wolfgang Mohr from General Electric uh, in Switzerland, who will give us an overview on the impact assessment for both uh, the innovation of turbine machinery components and uh, specific components to be performed at plant level. Wolfgang, you can now share your, your screen, please. Thank you. Fine. I think it is already shared. Yeah, it's Okay, there. perfect. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, then I would just jump in to save some time here. So essentially as prepared, we uh, are working for essentially strengthening our fleet uh, towards the transition period. So to master the transition period to essentially support the uh, transfer to a future 100% of renewable share, uh, which is not yet there. And what we see currently in the uh, conventional power plants, in the combined cycle power plants, is uh, uh, the intermittency of the actual demand going up and down. Essentially, our machines, which were originally designed uh, for as being base loaders, fluctuating very heavily uh, to essentially follow the market, to support the market and uh, to supply the grid stability. Uh, I have here an example of a typical F-class combined cycle power plant in the UK uh, with he heavy loads of uh, or heavy production of wind and essentially uh, the uh, the typical chair what you see here on the, on the bottom is the, the speed up in, in blue. This is essentially the rotational speed of the power plant uh, and then essentially the, the load uh, load changes which we see uh, where we as we where the uh, which is negotiated which is traded in the market and essentially the power plants whenever their money is is good enough uh, try to essentially make some money out of out of uh, delivering some power um, as discussed already by Christian huh, we uh, when we started the turbo reflex uh, project looking for some reasonable technologies to to support power plants. At that time, not nobody has seen this effect. Uh, there was some emerge in, uh, in in Denmark and northern Germany in the beginning, but that was not yet. And of, of course, also Spain, uh, but nowhere else. Most most in the in the world, typically or globally, uh, we are still having mostly base loading machines. But having some first indication, it was identified that we have essentially some uh, key performance indicators, which were also already mentioned. So one is essentially the part load efficiency, because I would have some benefits to operate the machine here a little bit more efficient. That's one part, which I could essentially define as uh, operational flexibility. Then the other point um, typically mentioned before because, because of maintenance is cycle cost. So how much does it actually cost to switch on and off? Because we do it now here in this example in, in two days distance. Sometimes we have now machines which are having two startups a day or up to two starts a day uh, because of the noon uh, drop as uh, solar power is essentially providing enough uh, power. Uh, such that the uh, conventional power plants 
actually have to decide to switch off or essentially go into a low mode. Now, what is a low mode? Low mode is essentially de de uh, defined by the emissions which we have there. Uh, as it's called an emission uh, emission compliant load, minimum emission compliant load. So we are not authorized to operate the machines in this red area. Uh, during the startup, essentially, uh, we can do what we want, but after we reach this level, we need to continue in the operation at uh, emissions which are compliant with the local uh, law. So this is essentially the uh, four key uh, performance indicators, and then you already had an introduction of all the uh, tasks which we have working on, which in the end are technologies which should be on a certain technology level, as it is for the transition period. Uh, the EU considers this as something which we should have immediately, essentially being able to operate the power plants soon in this mode, or now, essentially. Uh, so the technology level was uh, wished to be high. Uh, we talked about retrofits and upgrades, means uh, how can we improve the machine as, as it is in the moment, uh, because in the EU we have an oversupply of uh, conventional power, in particular because we have a, a strong growth of the renewables. Uh, it seems like you would need less of the conventional power plants, but in the end as a backup, you need at least, as was mentioned as well, nearly the same share as batteries are still not uh, available in, in that size as it would be required as a backup. Um, the uh, project itself uh, focused on two typical things, the F-class uh, combined cycle, as there's an enormous fleet in Europe of this size and the mo more modern uh, combined cycles are not really uh, installed and uh, on the same on the coal power plants, these 500 megawatt conventional power plants. I don't go into the detail uh, as essentially my task here is to explain you how we use the methodology in TurboReflex. What I already mentioned in the proposal, we already defined our key performance uh, indicators. In the in the key performance indicators, the, we essentially then uh, defined all the technologies to be de developed, uh, measurement systems, uh, um, new technologies, for instance, improved uh, compressors uh, by wall treatments uh, and so forth. The list I have just shown before, there is a tremendous detail and then essentially the question is how could we actually rate that in terms of the call, meaning how can we uh, manage the whole thing so how can we produce technology, not technologies, but products which customers would be interested in the end to give us an assessment? We want to know, is it actually, has it a value, this technology? Uh, can it impact the European uh, power generation market? Yes or no. And can it influence it in a, in a positive way or rather in a negative way? Because this is not really clear uh, from the beginning. So um, we started off essentially with uh, performance Im improvement on the component level. It's typically the question if you have, let's say, some uh, improved uh, blade, uh, what are you doing with this improved blade? Are you looking more for reduced maintenance cost or are you looking for, let's say, faster startups to be more flexible to compensate with the, uh, or to essentially to support the, the market? That's always a design question which has to be solved. And, and for this, we essentially build up a thermal model of the components and also of plants. Uh, but essentially with the steady state approach, uh, looking more on efficiency increase, things like that. We also had then to essentially think how we can put that into place in a, in a larger level, so in, on the plant level, plant scope. And on the plant scope, we essentially then need to have dynamic because there it's not only the component which is uh, is accountable for a delay in the startup, it's also essentially the control and the control very often just for protective reasons, essentially because we don't want to damage a road, uh, we don't want to damage the, uh, the high pressure parts as, as uh, they have some limitations on, on the speed up. And uh, as such, you need to essentially do a combined uh, model uh, to be able to essentially check if some of the ideas which we have here could actually fit the purpose of, of, of a accelerated started or 
at the other KPI, as I just mentioned, for instance, can we go to a lower uh, emission compliant load? Is it possible how to decrease it? Uh, for instance, with the wall contours, we could achieve a more stable uh, compressor, which is also digesting higher temperatures. So you can essentially, with air feedback, you can essentially go back to an even lower load, still having a good uh, emission level. Now, what does this then in the end help? Uh, is unclear, then we come to the next complex, is essentially how do I actually do the assessment? And we are using essentially a minute yourself full year dispatch optimi optimizer uh, with the approach of um, event, it's event based. That's how we uh, get to this minute resolved uh, resolution. And what we try to optimize is the object of a maximum income for the uh, power plant. So for a single power plant in an existing market uh, means that we just look on the historic plant commitments going up and down, just shown here the example uh, for, uh, because we would like to see why does the power plant work like this with this background which we have here. So we essentially put up everything into a, a, a plant technical specification and with this plant technical specification we can calculate and optimize dispatch. So when would it essentially be worthwhile for the power plant to produce power and when not. And uh, then essentially uh, to also think about what I just said before, we, say we have our technologies, we transform these technologies over all the simulations into a behavior of the power plant. We, upgraded so we need to have a description of the upgrade product and then we essentially can compare these two power plants operating in a specific a specific market to see where we have the advantage so you see here for instance the the yellow is starting faster than the original base load uh, or base base definition of this power plant in blue Okay, but then we are still not there so this is essentially what is we working in work package 5.0 or task 5.3 of this work package, uh, which is giving this overall whole plant performance. Um, we also have a work package 5.4, which then later on is um, uh, di discussed by Juan Carlos, where we essentially out of these improvements which we see and the income, we then have to uh, think about uh, development scenarios. So how how does the power power market change, and and what kind of risk do I have actually have to take uh, in case that I invest in some uh, improvement of the power plant? Now I have prepared here an example uh, subtask for three. One, which is essentially an instrumentation uh, development, but the instrumentation development allows us to essentially uh, do a water steam cycle preservation and with the water steam cycle preservation attached to another product, uh, flexibility product, which is already existing. We uh, essentially prepared the plant technical specification on a F class and giving having some startups, shutdowns, maintenance costs, operation costs, the efficiency which you can have, the efficiency which is reduced during the, uh, let's say, as a function of load that you don't have all, all the time um, uh, optimum efficiency. And then essentially you upgrade the product, uh, this power plant with a product, uh, which is now only by the technology enabled, but that's the product idea behind. Uh, um, we have then two products, one would be keep warm keeping of the steam turbine, the other one the hot keeping. It changes the uh, startup profile of this power plant accordingly. So it's essentially something that we uh, do with now the simulation I told you before. We prepare the startup uh, with doing the simulation by levering or leveraging this product. Um, coming then to a, a certain startup start shutdown condition and then running that into this uh, optimizer, dispatch optimizer as I, as I told. Of course having all the market data available. Here in this example that I show you is essentially the day I have market, the, the fuel prices and, and, and some emission on the CO2 emission costs. In 2017 this was rather low. Oh, thanks. thanks uh, to, to new, new changes, huh? it's becoming now more interesting because the CO2 price is now rising against, uh, again and is essentially supporting the idea of operational flexibility. And what you get then out if you have done the optimization is, is, is a full year dispatch. 
and there you see now several uh, points. So in the in the top you see essentially the the full dispatch in orange, which is the improved, and a little bit in between here the blue. Uh, which is the original power plant, not improved. Uh, we have essentially uh, easily to recognize uh, recognize some some min loads. So essentially startup procedure, power plants which goes to to low load, waiting for some time. Uh, others where essentially you can switch off and re and restart. And what you also get out of the full dispatch is then of course the um, the, the gain, the net gain which you make. Uh, essentially you have a the daily profit which you can make uh, and. Then you see, uh, which is essentially now again, uh, the one power plant and the other power plant. And now what do this, these peaks mean? These peaks is essentially the, 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 the cost which we have, which is associated with the start because of the use, lifetime use of the power plant. Because essentially uh, we need to have the people there which are actually doing the, the job. So there's many things linked into and has to be accounted for. And then we just compare essentially these two uh, one the upgrade the retrofitted power plant and the other one the, the base load and what you see is essentially if you run through in the year what is the difference this is the interest then in the end for the um, power plant uh, owner because essentially he sees then a certain net benefit which he can make out of this investment because he did the investment to improve it from the yellow shaped uh, from the blue shaped operation into the orange shaped operation and in the end you can essentially see how much of profit it has. Uh, I have prepared another slide here, the last slide essentially, showing the same product now, uh, calculated for a market in Germany, calculated for a market in the UK. And when we look at the, the optimized dispatches, just be, uh, as seen before, so uh, both products which we present, so the warm keeping and the hot keeping, are essentially uh, saving or reducing startup cost. Huh? And as such, uh, or not as such, but uh, because essentially less fuel and less operation uh, or, uh, maintenance cost, essentially because the, the actual use, lifetime use, was considered to be here reduced as uh, we start from uh, star hot temperatures. Then uh, on the dispatch, it's not just that we can say we have 5% more startups or, or, or shutdowns. Uh, it is essentially calculated. You see from the statistic, it's not too great. We don't have an infinite numbers of startup, but at, at least we can already have a look on it. So the, the zeros here is essentially the technology which uh, removes the cold starts or removes cold and warm starts. Um, what but you also see a change in the uh, low load operation. So some of the low load operations are now not anymore. The power plant doesn't not go back into low load because essentially being in this warm condition, it is of interest to actually, uh, you can stop the power plant, you keep the steam to be warm and then during the next restart, you just benefit of it. So this is the better option in many cases, instead of leaving the power plant running. Um, using some fuel in a, in, a, in a bad efficiency condition uh, and you just do it because you want to save the maintenance cost as the next startup again uh, is anyway awaited. So essentially you just uh, try to cope with the uh, negative income for some time, which is possible uh, just by this uh, minimum energy. A minimum emission compliant load which you are in to, to save money. So this is removed uh, and it depends on the market. How you see some of the markets uh, could welcome the technology, other markets don't do it as well, at all. And uh, Juan Carlos will then afterwards refer about the Spanish market. Okay, this is about it I would say. Thank you, Thanks, uh, you. Thank you very much uh, Wolfgang. Um, so now, um, directly here after hearing the OEM's perspective also here, we wanted to conclude by giving the floor to an end user who will share with us his perspective on uh, if the uh, Turbo Reflex project has been fulfilling the expectations when it comes to improving the, the power plant performance and flexibility. So our last speaker I'd like to welcome is Mr. Uh, Juan Carlos Garcia de Rio from Naturgy. Juan, can you? Uh, uh, well, yeah, the, here the I am. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Kirsten, for the introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is uh, Juan Carlos Garcia. I work for, for Naturgy Energy Group, a Spanish utility uh, part of the Turbo Ref Reflex project. Our role in the project is to perform the economic assessment on the flexibility products that arise from the different work packages using the, the Spanish market as a reference. The reasons for using Spain as the reference market for the project were that, first of all, our knowledge of European markets is concentrated in Spain. And second, the Spanish electricity market presents already a high level of renewable penetration, 47% of the energy mix uh, at the end of 2020, making it, in, in theory, a, a good candidate in the short term for the introduction of flexibility products on, on conventional generation assets. I will begin my presentation with a brief description of the Spain electricity system, both in its current state and as projected to 2030 in Spain's national energy and climate plan. Uh, so, um, Spain aims to add 60 gigawatts of additional renewable capacity by 2030, mainly, mainly solar, PV and wind, uh, but also storage. These capacity additions will translate to a 65% share of total generation by 2025 and a 79% share by 2030. On the conventional front, uh, coal generation share of the energy mix is currently marginal, uh, 2% in 2020, due to the increase in CO2 price since 2019, supported by the introduction of the market stability reserve by the European Union. That increase in price has made coal generation less competitive than combined cycles. Um, nuclear capacity amounts to 7 gigawatts of capacity and provides 23% of the energy mix. Uh, but uh, a plan, plan phase out of the nuclear fleet has been agreed between plant owners and the government to happen between 2027 and 2035. Uh, the combined cycle fleet uh, currently amounts to 25 gigawatts of capacity and in Spain's national energy plan is expected to remain and change uh, up to 2030. Uh, I will comment more on that, uh, that, that assumption later. Coming back to the renewable front, um, the Spanish government recently established minimum renewable capacity additions to be awarded in yearly auctions amounting to 20 gigawatts up to 2025. Uh, by the way, the auction corresponding to year 2020 has just been celebrated, awarding a total of 3 gigawatts of new capacity, 2 of solar PV and 1 of wind at an average price of 25 euros per megawatt hour, ref reflecting both the cost evolution of uh, renewable technologies over the past years, but also high levels of competition. Taking into account these auctions, plus the high level of new renewable development uh, via corporate PPAs and, and merchant projects, we could say that Spain is on track to meet its ambitious uh, renewable goals. This uh, renewable build-out uh, will have a depressing effect on combined cycles already low uh, capacity factors over the next years approaching single digits by 2025. This, uh, without some sort of capacity mechanisms in place, will make an already challenging financial situation for the combined cycle fleet uh, critical. Uh, right now, approximately 70% of the combined cycle fleet don't cover their fixed costs, uh, having negative EBITDA. On the other hand, uh, a good portion of the combined cycle fleet uh, will need to remain in the system to warrant this system adequacy. The graph on the right shows that the reserve margin of the system, currently at uh, healthy values, will decrease to unacceptable values uh, levels if the economically impaired combined cycles were to close in the incoming years. Switching to um, the topic of high levels of renewable integration, uh, the required system flexibility will have to be provided by, from different resources. Among them, conventional generation assets, uh, and in the case of Spain, that means um, combined cycles. To better serve the system needs, these combined cycles will need to improve their current capabilities. Among them, those flexibility products uh, as lower minimum loads, uh, shorter startup times, increased ramping capabilities, and improved parallel efficiency 
at the core of the Turbo Reflex project. As a reference, in the case of Spain, um, and due to the dark core effect caused mainly by high levels of solar PV, uh, the ramping needs uh, of the combined cycle will increase significantly, uh, increasing the highest ramps of today of about 750 megawatt per hour, almost by a factor of four uh, by 2030. Also, the number of starts on the combined cycle fleet is expected to uh, double uh, in 2030 from current levels. Those Combined cycles uh, with lower minimum loads, shorter startup times, and higher ramping capabilities will provide uh, more value to the system. So, in, in summary, um, on the generation front, uh, addi additional flexibility required for high levels of renewable integration will have to be provided by combined cycles. In this sense, the main objectives of the Turbo Reflex project are perfectly aligned with, with future system needs. In the specific case of Spain, uh, without capacity mechanisms, the current combined cycle capacity will be reduced in the future, posing a risk both to system adequacy, but also to high levels of renewable integration. Additionally, utilities in general are concentrating their capital investment in renewable growth, uh, limiting investment in conventional assets or, or making it more difficult via higher rates of return and shorter recovery periods. The value of flexibility products is not yet clear in current market conditions, though some initial signs of value begin to appear. For instance, uh, upward reserve requirements are beginning to grow in the, in the case of, of Spain. Um, so new, new market rules and products are needed to value flexibility on a technology resource neutral basis in order to have viable business cases for flexibility products. To sum up and conclude, uh, I believe, um, sorry, uh, I believe conventional generation assets and specifically combined cycles have a very important role to play in the energy transition, both from a system adequacy perspective and as a facilitator of high levels of renewable integration. For that, uh, first, and at the risk of stating the obvious, they will need to be in the system in the first place. And then <clears throat> they will need to incorporate additional flexibility, which has to be properly valued via the adaptation of current market rules and products to match system needs and, and different resources capabilities. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Carlos, for, for this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, concluding presentations of uh, um, of, of the project. Um, we are now opening up for any questions uh, from the audience, so please use the, the chat window. And uh, if you can, uh, if you have a specific question to one of the speaker, please uh, uh, just highlight, write the name and then the, your, your question, so we can ask them here. Um, while I'm waiting for maybe some, some uh, uh, Questions um, uh, to me, it it seems like uh, you know our sector has done its its job here when it comes to um, um, having uh, flexible uh, solutions uh, and developing flexible solutions in place. We all know that we are going through this energy transition um, and uh, phase out of coal plants, etc. And and this huge amount of increasing uh, amount of, of uh, non-dispatchable uh, renewable energy coming into the grid. So would you say a little bit that we are uh, in this project that the solutions here is, is slightly maybe ahead of the market? We, we need now to uh, wait here uh, for the market to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to catch up and, and to the, the slightly new uh, ways, uh, um, I mean, the new uh, boundary conditions to, to, to be uh, set up to make it really uh, uh, interesting to implement at the moment. Uh, maybe Juan Carlos, if you could just. Yes, um, I think as I mentioned in the, my final slide, I think there are beginning to appear some signs of value uh, in the case of Spain with uh, higher levels of renewable penetration that 
also has because of the 2020 effect on demand uh, because of the pan pandemic um, that uh, has made this effect probably begin to appear a couple of years earlier maybe um, so we are beginning to see some additional requirements for the combined cycle i mean increasing number of startups at downs uh, and so these signs are beginning to appear but uh, the the market rules are not yet uh, developed uh, fully to to account for for that flexibility because the system still is, is not uh, at, at an average let's say it's not lacking flexibility yet uh, so your mm. question um, i think this technical solutions technical improvements uh, need to happen right now uh, because i mean these innovations take time uh, we are it's not something that you can produce in next six months period so mm. i think it's to have this uh, already advanced is is necessary um, but we need also uh, the evolution. Maybe it's a combination of both things. Maybe uh, market uh, begins to show signs of value in, in current products or, or markets. But I think there is also work to do in, in, in regulation, adapting market rules uh, to properly value uh, what the system is beginning to need and definitely will need in the case of Spain probably in a couple of years that will be great uh, in the rest of Europe maybe that could take uh, a bit more time if, if mm. uh, renewable uh, penetration is not so high right now to make a comment here in addition so even if there are now signs in the market that it would be some value uh, we have missed design in in the market since several years now we are developing uh, op operational flexibility products now over the last six seven years uh, but there is no budget in, in, in our companies uh, to actually push that uh, forward as there is no value in it so essentially uh, it is in the development we essentially stuck a little bit uh, there are many more things which we should improve on the power plants because these power plants were all designed for as being base loading machines and uh, actually then operating them more flexible uh, will pop up with a lot of uh, different um, uh, problems which we foresee as well and uh, nobody was working on it uh, as there is no market for it so in the end uh, i think th th there's an urgency to actually master it uh, master this support which I uh, explained in the future because seeing now some first values coming up is a little bit late uh, and we should actually uh, prepare the market much better in this direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Alexander you had something. Uh, it looks, uh, yes, just, mm -hmm. I think uh, most of the European countries have uh, already decided to abandon coal in the future. So uh, there are some uh, dedicated dates when all coal power plants uh, shall be uh, replaced by something else. And in the traditional phase, of course, uh, so the um, traditional plant will be uh, the gas turbine driven plant. A gas, uh, but uh, at the currently, <clears throat> so there are not enough incentives to do that because uh, still, uh, so the um, uh, price for coal uh, in, in particular, lig lignite coal is uh, too cheap, and uh, we need uh, some. Uh, uh, we also need some um, um, uh, incentives uh, just created by the uh, European partner states, and uh, maybe also um, um, uh, by the uh, EU, mm. uh, just to um, uh, increase uh, the transition from coal power plant to um, uh, gas turbine to power plant because uh, we we have we need to look at also at the uh, in the uh, in connection of the decarbonization of the green deal uh, of the uh, EU and this means that we have to reduce our emissions considerably and this can be naturally be done by just replacing coal plants by uh, gas um, uh, by combined cycle plants by uh, combined heat power plants uh, so there's a potential to reduce uh, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions by about 30-30%. Uh, mm. 
Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, um, Alexander, for that. Uh, and I would, on that note, I would also like to just to, to highlight to everyone that uh, to conclude these episodes that we have now had with a number of projects that we have, uh, we are going to have one final session called R&D for flexible power generation today and tomorrow's challenges and pathways. And this will be a uh, follow up, let's say a panel session here where we would invite all uh, a representative from all these projects and together also invite people from the European Commission. So we can discuss a little bit what you just said here, Alexander, to see how we could uh, basically uh, first uh, see if there's additional R&D needs that would be uh, uh, need to be addressed, but also uh, the requirements from a market point of view and from a stability point of view, et cetera. And, um, uh, and um, different incentives that needs to be in place uh, to really to showcase that our technology can uh, enable this uh, huge uh, uh, implementation of non-dispatchable uh, renewable energy that is, is coming into to place. So um, I hope that uh, all of you would be uh, able to join this uh, um, session, which take place the 20th of April. Uh, 11.40 to 1 p.m., so it would be slightly longer than the previous one to, to have some debates with the European Commission. Uh, so we uh, look forward to that. And finally, before closing this session, I will also just to highlight that ETN will be holding our annual meeting and workshop week with daily two hours afternoon sessions from the 15th of March until the 22nd of March. And I can promise you a very exciting and interactive program not to be missed. And registration is free and can be done uh, uh, for all ETN members on our website, www.etn.global. Finally, um, I would like to thank all the speakers and the audience for your interest and for your active participation. So take care and stay healthy and looking forward to see you uh, soon again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you a lot. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.